Good evening, faithful viewers of Rhode Isle versus the world. My name, to those who already don't know, is Thomas Burris. I will be acting as program moderator for the duration of tonight's episode. Unfortunately, as program moderator, it's my grim duty to inform you that this week's episode has been canceled, largely due to the death of all three of the series creators and a ham. However, do not fret, as the three new episodes will begin airing next Monday all the way through the season finale on December 19th. Lastly, since the deceased were contractually obliged to deliver at least 10 minutes of new content every week, I will lend my talents to their forsaken souls and to you at home with a selection from Miguel de Cervantes' masterstroke, Don Quixote. Chapter 27. The barber did not think the priest's invention was a bad idea. In fact, it seemed so good that they immediately began to put it in into effect. They asked the innkeeper's wife for a skirt and a bonnet, giving her a security one as the priest's new cassocks. The barber made a long beard out of a gray or red oxtail where the innkeeper hung his comb. The innkeeper's wife asked why they wanted those things. The priest told her briefly about Don Quixote's madness and how the disguise were just the thing to get him out of the mountains, which is where he was now. Then the innkeeper and his wife realized that the madman had been their guest, the one who made the balm and was the master squire who had been tossed in the blanket, and they recounted to the priest everything that had happened, not keeping silent about the thing Sancho had kept so secret. In short, the innkeeper's wife outfitted the priest in the most remarkable fashion. She dressed him in a woolen skirt with black velvet stripes and hands span wide, and all of them set slashed, and the bodies of green velvet adorned with white satin binding, and both the bodies and the skirt must have been made in the ways of King Wamba. The priest did not permit his head to be adorned, but he did put on a cap of quilted linen that he wore to sleep at night and tied it around the front with a hand black taffeta. And with another band, he fashioned a mask that covered his beard and face very well. He pulled his broad brimmed hat down tightly on his head, and it was so large he could have used it as a parcel. He wrapped himself in his cape and mounted his mule, side saddle, the barber, with a beard somewhere between red and white that hung down to his waist and was made, as we have said, from the tail of a reddish ox, mounted his mule as well. They said goodbye to every, everyone, including the good Mariton Tornes, who promised to say a rosary, although a sinner, and asked God to grant them success in so arduous and Christian an enterprise as the one they had undertaken. But as soon as he had ridden out of the inn, it occurred to the priest that he was committing an error by dressing in that manner, for it was an indecent thing for a member of the clergy to do, no matter how important the end, he told this to the barber and asked him to trade clothes with him, since it would be better if the barber was the damsel in distress and the priest played the part of the squire. In this way, his office would be less profaned. But if the barber did not want to make the change, he had decided to go no further even if the devil made off with Don Quixote. At this point, Sancho approached, and when he saw the two men, 
two men in those clothes. He could not control his laughter. The barber, in fact, agreed to everything the priest said. And as they traded disguises, the priest informed him how he would behave and the words he had to say to Don Quixote in order to move and oblige him to go away with him and leave the place he had chosen for this useless penance. The barber responded that he had no need for instruction and would do everything perfectly. He did not want to put on his disguise until they were near the place where they would, would find Don Quixote. And so he folded the garments and the priests adjusted the beard and they continued their journey led by Sancho Panza, who recounted what had happened with a madman they had come across in the Sierra, although he didn't hide his discovery of the traveling case and everything that was in it. For although he was a fool, the squire was somewhat greedy. On the following day, they reached the place where Sancho had made the trail of broom so that he could find the spot where they had left his master. And when he was this, when he saw this, he said that this was the way into the mountains, and they ought to put on their disguises if that was needed to achieve his master's freedom. They had told him earlier that doing what they were doing and dressing in the fashion were crucial in freeing his master from the injunctious life he had chosen. And they had charged him repeatedly that he was not to tell his master who they were or that he knew them. It was his master, if his master asked, he would, he was bound to ask. If he had given the letter to Dulciano, he was to say yes. And because he did not know how to read, she had spoken her reply. Sancho listened to everything and noticed it carefully in his mind and thank and thanked them profusely for their intention to advise this, his master to be an emperor and not an archbishop, because in his, in his opinion, as far as grant, granting favors to their squires was concerned, emperors could no more than archbishops errant. He also said it would be a good idea if he went first and found his master and told him his lady's reply for that would probably be enough to make him leave the place, saving them a good deal of trouble. What Sancho said seemed reasonable, and they decided to wait until they came back with the news that he had found his master. Sancho entered the ravines of the Sierra, leaving the priest and barber and one where a small, gentle stream ran in the cool, pleasant shade cast by other rocky crags and the trees that grew all around. They had come there on a day in August, and the heat was intense, particularly in that area. The time was three in the afternoon, making the spot even more pleasant and inviting to, to, to them to wait until Sancho returned, which is, why, which is what they did. While the two men were resting in the shade, a voice unaccompanied by the music of any other instrument reached their ears, and it sounded so sweet and delicate that they were more than a little taken aback, for the place did not seem the kind where... Mm -hmm. 